So you will of course try to establish that, uh, that the patient's weakness is lower motor neuron in nature. Then after which we will decide whether the patient is predominantly disturbed, like in this case, or predominantly proximal, like in this case. Then the next question in our, our system of examination would be, from history as well as examination, we will try to decide whether the sensation is normal or abnormal. Okay. So if the sensation is abnormal and if it is confined to one or two limbs, then we know it doesn't fit into a nice glove and stocking pattern. If it doesn't fit into a nice glove and stocking pattern, then we realize there are two possibilities. We are dealing with peripheral nerve, individual peripheral nerve disorders, or we are dealing with individual segments, nerve root disorders. Most of these times, the patients have isolated peripheral nerve or isolated nerve root involvement. For example, this patient with a peroneal neuropathy, this patient with a C8 radiculopathy, this patient with a radial neuropathy, it can be isolated, just one nerve. But whenever you see that a patient's pattern of weakness and sensory loss seems to be more than that of nerve scoping, are we dealing with brachial plexopathy or lumbar sacral plexopathy? Now, of course, a patient with focal weakness can also present with proximal weakness. If it's proximal weakness with normal sensation, Again, again, we have to start thinking, especially if it's more than one distribution, are we dealing with a lumbosacral plexus if it's the lower limb or brachial plexopathy if it's the upper limb? Okay, so this is the general scheme that I'll be using time and again. But the first message that I would like to transmit uh, as far as brachial plexus or any plexopathy is concerned is that we have to overcome the fear that we have of the complexity of the brachial plexus. And I, I must give credit to this good work by Dr. Ferrande and the late uh, Dr. Wilborn, who have written a beautiful seminal article from which I learned a lot. And most of what I'm going to discuss is actually derived from the methods uh, propagated in this seminal paper. Okay. So how do we overcome the fear of the brachial plexus? Now, I would start off by very simply saying that you only need to remember only one thing. And the only one thing you need to remember is that the brachial plexus is made up of 5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. Because there's no way you could possibly figure this out. You have to memorize this. But beyond that, I would like to propose that we don't have to memorize anything more than that. Let me show you why. Because if you think about it, if C5, C6, C7, C8, T1, we have 5. And we need to form 3 trunks. So obviously, we take the first 2 and form the upper trunk. We take the bottom two and form the lower trunk. Okay. And then, of course, you have no choice now, but the middle trunk must come from C7. So without much memory, you know that C5, C6 make the upper trunk. C8, T1 makes the lower trunk. And C7 makes the middle trunk. Then we know that the arm is actually an extension of the body. Right. As we know, we all started off with a tubular sort of structure and then the arms grew out of it. While the arms grew out of it, they pull the nerves through into the arms. If they pull the nerves through the arms, the anterior compartment, which is predominantly for flexion, and then there's a posterior compartment is predominantly for extension. So that means the nerves as they're entering the brachial plexus must divide into anterior and posterior division. And obviously the posterior division must go to the extensor compartment. And that will remind you that all three posterior divisions must merge together to form the posterior cord. And what is the predominant nerve in the posterior compartment? Extension nerve, radial nerve. So it must be the radial nerve. So all three posterior divisions merge together to form the posterior cord. Posterior cord goes on to form the radial nerve. And just before it becomes the radial nerve, the axillary nerve will come out of it. Okay, so we have covered a significant part of the brachial plexus already. Now, if you look at the arm, now remember the nerves were coming out through the arm from the body. Now, the lowest part must be coming from the lower part of the brachial plexus. So, the lower trunk. The lower trunk has got an anterior division. If the anterior division follows through all the way to the end, what will it mean? It will meet things that are innervated by the ulnar nerve. So, that will remind you that the anterior division 
forms the medial cord and it goes on to form the ulnar nerve. Okay, so the anterior division of the lower trunk goes on to form the medial cord because that's the medial part. And naturally, as you can see, it goes on to form the only structures here are the ulnar innervated structures. So therefore, it must be the ulnar nerve. And because it's going through the medial part of the forearm, that will remind you that it must give off the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm before it reaches the ulnar nerve, before it becomes the ulnar nerve. So now we have the radial nerve, we have the ulnar nerve. Now, what do we have left now? We took the posterior divisions of all the trunks. We took the anterior division of the lower trunk. What do we have left? Therefore, there was no choice. We only have two left. We have the anterior division of the middle trunk and the anterior division of the upper trunk. So what must we do? We have no choice but to merge them to form the lateral cord. And the lateral cord goes forward and the first muscle that will meet is the biceps. And it will go on and remember there was a medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm and therefore there must be a lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. So therefore you're not surprised that it's called the musculocutaneous nerve because it's an extension of the lateral cord. So now we realize that we have actually just by working through, just by memorizing, just only one thing, C5, C6, C7, C8, T1 makes up the brachial plexus. We have figured out almost all the nerves. Now the only nerve that's missing is the median nerve. Now, median nerve is very interesting. And the way to remember it is looking at our, brachial, our, our patients who come to us with carpal tunnel syndrome. So this is a classic carpal tunnel patient, right? What does she complain of? She complains of weakness in the tina eminence, which is mainly T1, lower part of the brachial plexus. But she also complains of numbness here, here, and here. So what areas are these? These are C6 and C7 areas. So you realize that the median nerve has to be very complex. It has to come from two very disparate parts of the brachial plexus. So I think whenever I talk to my Egyptian friends, uh, you have heard me uh, make this joke about how in history we had a northern Egypt and we had a southern Egypt. And then we, the northern and southern Egypt merged together to form the greater Egypt, right? So the same way, the median nerve is a, must be a combination of two branches coming from the upper part of the brachial plexus and the lower part of the brachial plexus. And the only way you can do that is to get a branch from the lateral cord and a branch from the medial cord. The branch from the medial cord obviously is responsible for the tina eminence. And the branch from the lateral cord, which is coming from this area, will be responsible. Remembering our carpal tunnel patients, we'll be able to figure out that the median nerve comes from branches coming from the lateral and the medial cord. Okay? Now, now that we have got all the big nerves out of the way, we only have a few small nerves to worry about. We have the suprascapular nerve here. The suprascapular nerve coming from the upper trunk. C5, the we have the long thoracic nerve. So, so, so the prophet, any, anyone? Well, this requires a little bit of memory. Please, this requires a little bit of memory, but beyond that, I think uh, we, we, we could work out most of the thing. Okay. So now, realize that you've got it whole. I think somebody is. Uh, someone. Somebody is. Uh, Zoom is not on mute, so it's very hard. Clear. Please. Okay, I'll try to speak over the the noise. It's okay. Okay. Five. So. So now we have gotten the brachial plexus anatomy sorted out. But let's think about the functional anatomy. The functional anatomy for clinicians has to think about the nerves from a different angle. So for example, whenever we think about ulnar nerve as a clinician or as an electrodiagnostician, we have to think that this is the ulnar nerve. Where is it born? It's born at CAT1. How does it get? What primary school does it go to? It goes to the lower trunk. Then after that, what secondary school does it go to? Anterior division, medial cord, and then it ends up in the final location. So by knowing all these structures, okay, we have a detailed anatomy, not just of the ulnar nerve, but also how it traverses through the brachial plexus. Likewise, the radial nerve is born at C7 and C8. Okay? It has to travel through three different, it has to travel through upper, Sorry, it has to travel through the middle and the lower trunk. Okay? Then posterior division, posterior cord, 
and then the finally the muscles of the radial nerve. Medial nerve we already discussed, right? There are two components to it. The lower part comes from CAT1 through the medial cord, the branch comes out from the medial nerve. The upper part comes from C5, C6, sorry, C6, C7 through the lateral cord and forms the medial nerve. So likewise, if you look at the axillary nerve, axillary nerve, this is an important one, so I want you to pay attention to this. Axillary nerve is born in C5, C6. Where does it go to primary school? It goes to upper trunk. But then after that, it leaves up that primary school and goes to secondary school in and I use the analogy of primary and secondary school to just explain how they reach the final location. So C5, C6, upper trunk, posterior division, posterior cord, and then to the deltoid muscle. Okay. Now, a very similar muscle, similar nerve is the musculocutaneous nerve. It also starts from C5, C6. It also goes to upper trunk, but it goes to a different secondary school. It goes to there anterior division and lateral cord and then to the biceps muscle so this is very useful for the clinician right because remember we always talk about the zebra stripe right if you want to differentiate a zebra from a horse we shouldn't talk about the forelegs we should talk about the we should talk about the the black and white stripes so if you want to know whether the patient's problem is in the posterior cord or lateral cord then looking at axillary nerve and musculocutaneous nerve clinically as well as by EMG would be ideal because axillary nerve and musculocutaneous nerve have share the same nerve roots come from the same trunk but they go through different cords. If you want to differentiate a posterior cord from a lateral cord, you get what muscle must you look for? Traveling through both the upper trunk and the middle trunk. But at then, in, unlike the musculocutaneous or axillary nerve, it goes up to the, unlike the axillary nerve, it goes up to the lateral cord and ends up in the median nerve. So, if you want to differentiate, again, uh, a, middle, uh, uh, a middle trunk problem, for example, okay, or a C7 problem, from axillary nerve, then the muscle that you want to, from C5, C6 or upper trunk problem, then the muscle that you want to go for is the, is the pronated teres. Let me explain this one more time, just because it's an important point. So pronated, see axillary nerve comes from C5, C6, goes to the upper trunk, okay, then it goes to the posterior cord and ends up in the axillary uh, nerve and the deltoid muscle. Pronated teres, the nerve to the pronated teres muscle, starts off from C6, C7, okay, goes through both upper and middle trunk. Okay. Then instead of going through the posterior cord, it goes through the lateral cord. So again, if you want to differentiate a lateral cord lesion from a posterior cord lesion, just like looking at axillary nerve and musculocutaneous nerve, you can look at deltoid muscle versus the pronated teres muscle. Likewise, because the pronated teres has C6, C7 as opposed to C5, C6, you can again use the pronated teres muscle to differentiate a lesion in the C5, C6 region as opposed to C6, C7 nerve roots. So the reason why we are emphasizing all this anatomy is these fine details about the anatomy will allow you to interrogate the patient more exquisitely and detect lesions within the substructure of the brachial plexus. So likewise, when we study, likewise when we study the uh, uh, sensory nerves. Now, many of us will study, for example, a routine nerve study that we do is digit five, right? Digit five ulnar nerve. So digit five ulnar nerve comes from C8. It travels down the lower trunk, medial cord, and reaches the digit five. Now, digit two that we often use for carpal tunnel is not so useful when we want to interrogate the brachial plexus because 50% of the time is coming from C6, 50% of the time is coming from C7, digit two, okay? While we prefer digit one, which is your thumb, because most of the time it's coming from C6, upper trunk, anterior division, lateral cord, and then median nerve. So when we are studying these nerves, we know which part of the brachial plexus we are interrogating. 
Now, some of you may be confused. Why am I talking about all these things? Because from a practical point of view, from a practical point of view, um, you can't possibly be thinking about all these things in the busy electrodiagnostic clinic. And that's when, that's when, when you are seeing a patient, a table like this is very useful. A table like this is actually derived from this, except that I've inverted it the other way around. Okay, this has been inverted. So all you need to do is that if you suspect a patient has upper trunk pathology and the differential diagnosis is lateral cord, okay? Differential diagnosis is lateral cord. Then you can start doing the sensory nerves and see which are abnormal. If the nerves on this side of the box is abnormal, but this side of the box is normal, then you start thinking this must be upper trunk pathology. Likewise, these are the motor nerves you would interrogate when you are suspecting upper trunk pathology. And this is the motor nerves you will interrogate if you are suspecting lateral cord pathology. And likewise, for EMG, these are the muscles you would EMG when you are suspecting upper trunk pathology. And these are the muscles you will be interrogating if you are suspecting lateral cord pathology. Okay? Now, of course, based on the zebra strap principle, it becomes obvious that if the pathology is confined to these nerves, but these nerves are spared, then of course the problem would be in the upper trunk. Okay? And likewise, if the pathology is confined to these nerves, these structures, but not these structures, then obviously the pathology is confined to the lateral cord. Okay, so let's use some examples to illustrate that. This is a middle-aged man presenting with fairly sudden, severe, unremitting pain over the right shoulder. He requires it so bad that he needs rush to the emergency department and he needs opioids for a few days. After about one week, the pain settles. Then he notices as an afterthought that his shoulder is actually very, very weak and there's severe wasting of the shoulder even though the onset was only about a week. Examination suggests uh, wasting of the deltoid, biceps, perisacular muscles, periscapular muscles, absent biceps and brachiorodialis reflex, and mild sensory loss over the lateral aspect and so on. So again, if we go back to this diagram, clearly the signs are lower motor neuron. The pattern of weakness is predominantly proximal. Okay. Sensation is clearly abnormal. Okay. So we could be dealing with a plexus pathology in this case, obviously because of the structures that are involved. This could be upper trunk brachial plexopathy, or we could be dealing with biceps and brachial So must be C5, C6, radiculopathy. So, using our favorite animal, how do we differentiate between C5, C6 radiculopathy from upper trunk brachial plexopathy? You will take a table like this. Okay. You know, you are thinking about upper trunk. Okay. If this was probably, if this was indeed upper trunk brachial plexopathy, as you would think about in a patient with, this story sounds very much like Parsonage Turner syndrome. You would expect that the sensory potentials of the lateral cutaneous nerve, the forearm, digit one median, will be abnormal. If this was from C5, C6, because it's a preganglionic lesion, you would expect the lateral cutaneous nerve, the forearm, and digit one to be normal. So, actually, in a busy electrodiagnostic clinic, just starting off with the sensory potentials of these two will straight away, of course, we have spent a lot of time in history taking. We spent a lot of time in detailed clinical exam and all we needed to do was think about what we needed to do and did those relevant nerves. Lateral cutis nerve the form. Digit one, if they are abnormal, they must be plexopathy. If they are normal, they must be a preganglionic lesion in C5, C6. Then you would investigate the patient accordingly. Of course, you could do the motor nerve studies and you could do the EMG. And in EMG, particularly, you will go for cervical paraspinal because you would expect the paraspinal muscles to be more affected in C5, C6 radiculopathy, okay, as opposed to um, a brachial plexopathy. Okay, so you realize that the time spent in actual electrodiagnosis can be very short because of a very careful clinical analysis and planning of the study. Let's go on to another patient. Okay, a 50-year-old lady comes to us with complaining of weakness and numbness in the right hand for the last six months. She has a right mastectomy two years ago for carcinoma of the breast. There was evidence of local spread, so she received radiation to the axilla. She also has a long history of neck pain and the general practitioner who sent you 
the patient has sent uh, has done an x-ray of the neck and the x-ray shows multiple bony spurs so again clinically they are worried about two different pathology so let's have a look at her her examination is again lower motor neuron okay the pattern of weakness because it's mainly in the hand is disturbed sensation is clearly abnormal okay so we are either dealing with a nerve or a nerve root okay but clearly the weakness is involving more than the distribution of one nerve tena and hypotenea eminence so it cannot be one nerve it must be more than one nerve and we already said whenever you see more than one nerve in one limb you must start thinking about plexus right likewise if it is more than one segment you have to think about multi segmental disease okay which can happen okay so differential diagnosis is right lower trunk brachial plexopathy okay versus c8 and t1 because obviously c8 cannot explain just the eminence so you need both uh, c8 t1 radiculopathy again how would you differentiate it we go to our table in the lower trunk pathology you would expect digit 5 very easy nerve to do routine nerve conduction study ulnar nerve recorded at digit 5 will be abnormal and you add on one more nerve medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm if these two are abnormal we know straight away this is a plexopathy if the these two nerves are completely normal even though she had carcinoma of the breast even though she had radiation to the axilla we would be sus more suspicious of cat1 radiculopathy because it's a preganglionic lesion and therefore we would go on and do emg of the paraspinal muscles and confirm that the paraspinal muscles are affected and of course clinically you would also expect with cat1 radiculopathy some um, evidence of horner syndrome in the ipsilateral side so this would be very important right because a lot of these patients they have coincidental degenerative spondylotic disease in the spine shown on the x rays but they also have a very sinister sounding history like carcinoma of the breast to radiation two things could have happened she could have had recurrence of the carcinoma with metastatic disease to the axilla involving the lower trunk or that she is delayed she is getting the delayed consequence of radiation plexitis as evidenced by the um as 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 as, as you would suspect from the very prominent fasciculations that were noted in her So these are the three different diagnoses as you can see all three have serious connotations so the electrodiagnostication is very important in discerning firstly that it's the brachial plexopathy and not the radiculopathy and then also by emging these muscles okay emging these muscles if he finds a lot of spontaneous axonal hyperexcitability syndrome for example myokinia neuromyotonia these are features to suggest that this is more likely to be radiation plexopathy rather than metastatic disease so with this information although it's not a full proof information you can still have metastatic disease on top of radiation plexitis you could at least help the oncologist manage this patient and get them away from the distraction of the the spurs that were noted on the cervical spine mri cervical spine x rays okay come to the last patient this is a very interesting patient she came to us uh, with this story that she has chronic wasting of both hands oh sorry chronic wasting on the right hand okay with um, not much sensory complaints so the doctor who the neurologist who referred this patient to me was actually suspecting motor neuron disease because she had uh, insidious onset of this wasting with not much sensory complaints and you know many of us are familiar with this split hand sign the split hand sign is a very interesting sign that you know motor neuron disease is a disease that affects anterior horn cell in segments so if it's affecting c8 all the c8 anterior horn cells should die if it's affecting t1 all the anterior horn cells should die so if it's affecting c8 t1 segment it should affect both the hypotena eminence as well as the the sorry the tena eminence as well as the hypotena eminence. but in motor neuron disease often you find that the tena eminence is disproportionately wasted together with the first interosseal introsciae but the hypotena eminence is relatively spare so if you think about it it's like a split hand phenomenon 
This part of the hand is not wasted. This part of the hand is wasted here as well as here. So this um, was, and actually it is quite a useful sign because we often see this sinister sign in motor neuron disease. So she seems to have it. As you can see in the next picture, you can see that the thema eminence is very wasted here and together with the dorsal introsis. So this part of the hand is very badly affected. But uh, hypothena eminence, hypothena eminence is very, very fleshy, quite normal, correct? So, so this made the referring physician was very worried about motor neuron disease. So actually the referring diagnosis was motor neuron disease. But what we did was we spoke to her at length and then um, we went through the protocol, low motor neuron distal weakness. And the key thing, as you can see here, the key thing, as you can see in this diagram, is whether the sensation is normal or abnormal, right? You cannot make a mistake here. Because if it's normal, you get different diagnosis. Abnormal, you get different diagnosis. So, so we, we went through in detail. And, and if she, initially, she was a little bit vague. But, but when we persevered, okay, and examined her more carefully, as you can, you know whether you can hear my video. So here, I'm asking her, how much is this? She says this is $100, okay? But the right hand, she says is $70. So she gives me a 30% decrease here. So likewise, when I do it here, um, this part of the medial part of the forearm, $100, but she will only give me $50 per hand. This is 100 How much is it? 70 or 70 70 dollars okay. so so it's about 30 percent decrease so 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 there is some sensory loss so that is a bit worrying isn't it so if there is sensory loss then you think if there is sensory loss you have to come to this part of the algorithm right if this part of the algorithm then you have to start thinking about because it's more than one nerve distribution are we dealing again with the plexopathy okay or could it be a nerve root? Again, if it's nerve root, it has to be CAT1. But then she's not sure about the sensory complaint. And it's quite subtle. So if we are wrong about the sensory abnormalities, then we are dealing with two differential diagnoses here. Multifocal motor neuropathy or some form of motor neuron disease, which was what the referring physician sent us. It could be ALS or it could be one of those limited form of motor neuron disease. So these were the various differential diagnoses. So we decided to examine her a little bit more carefully. So the sensory exam, we, we dug and dug and dug, and she said, said that maybe if she, the sensory loss is present, if she carries a heavy objects and carry and walks for long distance. And then when we looked at her a little bit more carefully, we noticed that there was some fullness in the right supraclavicular area. Now, you may be more convinced if you see the gold chain here, it's a bit lower than this gold chain. It's going across. You see, it's, 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 you can see here, the shadow. It's going across the supraclavicular fossa here. It's sitting nicely here. So there seems to be a, a fullness here. And in the next video, maybe you can appreciate it a little bit better. There is some fullness here. And maybe you can even see a little bit of pulsation. Okay. And then we were not quite sure about it, but we couldn't get it tested. This is just before COVID and all that. So, um, uh, no, actually, this was some time ago, but I'm not sure why we didn't get tested. So, in the dark room, we noticed that the right eye was slightly myotic, slight ptosis, okay? And, yeah, and, and, and the, what we call the reverse ptosis sign, right? So, slight, slight ptosis and slight meiosis in darkness, okay? I'll play it again. It's very mild ptosis. So, again, if this was clear cut harness, then that would point towards, point towards, a T1 radiculopathy, very proximal lesion. So it looks like the candidates for this race um, are all racing and they all seem to be equally uh, likely to win the race. It could be CAT1 radiculopathy, it could be lower trunk plexopathy, it could be motor neuron disease of some sort, or it could be MMA. So what do we do? Well, we go to our faithful table. Okay, how do we EDX her? Well, if you look at our, um, uh, we are thinking about lower trunk. If it's lower trunk plexus problem, what do you expect to see? You will expect to see digit 5 abnormal. You would expect to see medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm abnormal. If it's MND, this should be normal. If it's MMN, this should be normal. If it's CAT1, this should be normal. So, first test you would do is digit 5 sensory potential and medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. If it's abnormal, you got the diagnosis, end of case. Correct?
But of course, we cannot make such a short electrodiagnosis. We'll go on. And what do we do when we do the moto study? So in the moto studies, you'll be particularly interested to see whether there is any conduction block. So here, I would study the median null nerve very carefully, all the way to Erb's point, to see whether there is any conduction block, because this is a very treatable disease, although a wasting is disproportionate. Usually, you don't see this level of wasting. But nevertheless, because uh, it's a treatable disease, we have to look hard for it. So we look hard for a, a conduction block, and we didn't find it. Then, of course, EMG will be very useful. Because the survivor, remember she had a bit of horn, she, we thought she had Horner's syndrome. So if she had Horner's syndrome, there should be, uh, it could be a radiculopathy, CAT1 radiculopathy. If it's CAT1 radiculopathy, there should be denervation in the paraspinal muscles. Okay. So this is how you would have addressed this patient's electrodiagnosis. So that's what we did. Okay. And the answers for the electrodiagnosis was, well, first of all, we did find a decreased snap of both digit 5 sensory potential, as well as the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. But more interestingly, the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm was completely gone, while digit 5 was reduced. Clinically, the same thing also, right? Remember, she said there was mild numbness in the digit 5, but 70%, a 30% reduction in the medial, medial aspect of the forearm. So that means the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm is affected more than digit 5. And likewise, when we did the median Lalda nerve study, we didn't find any conduction problem. But we found that the median CMAP, as expected from the wasting, was severely reduced, while the ALNA CMAP was only partially reduced. So again, this particular, and then of course the EMG didn't show any signs of paraspinal denervation. So of course, this cannot be motor neuron disease because there's sensory involvement, cannot be multifocal motor neuropathy because there's sensory involvement, and the lack of uh, the involvement of sensory nerve potential rules out radiculopathy, the lack of EMG denervation in the cervical paraspinal muscles also rules out um, cervical radiculopathy. So the diagnosis here is a lower trunk brachial plexopathy. In this particular case, this particular pattern is most commonly seen in the what we refer to as a neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, which is usually due to a accessory rib. So normally we don't have a rib at C8, right? We have a rib at T1 and that's it. But if you have a rib at C8, can you imagine now the brachial plexus, the T1 component and the C8 component has to go up and then come down like a tent, like a tent, T-E-N-T. -E it has to go up and come down. So when it goes up and comes down, the one that is under most pressure would be the T1 component of the Upper trunk, uh, the, of the lower trunk, right? The T1 uh, nerves are the ones that have to really go up from T1, go all the way up to CA because now there is an interfering CA rib, go up all the way and come down. So T1 gets affected more than C8. So because the T1 component of the lower trunk gets affected more than C8, you're not surprised that the medial cutaneous nerve, the forearm, is worse, is more affected than digit 5 sensory potential. And the CMAP of median, which is predominantly T1, is affected more than the ALNA CMAP, which is predominantly C8. So this particular pattern will make us evaluate her. So we send her straight for an MRI of the brachial plexus. And indeed, there was a, 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 a cervical root, but a, sorry, cervical rib, but it wasn't mostly bony. That's why the x-rays couldn't show it. Most of it was a soft tissue fibrous. So basically, the the, the, the fibrous tissue is supposed to have worn uh, as we grow, uh, uh, as we develop, it's supposed to have disappeared. But in some patients, it remains. But it may not remain as a calcified bone, it remains as a fibrous band, but it was enough to cause problems against the lower trunk of the brain. Okay? So, in summary, I have uh, hopefully, okay, using a, a method of uh, uh, drawing the brachial plexus and just remembering that there the, are the five roots responsible for the brachial plexus, we managed to draw out the anatomy and you must admit that it doesn't require too much of memory and it can be done with just a little bit of um, just a little bit of logic. Then after that, detailed anatomy, understanding the detailed anatomy allows us to interrogate various parts of the brachial plexus. And to do that, of course, for the busy clinician, the busy electrodiagnostician, can use a table like this. 
okay, rather than actually draw out the anatomy every time. And that this draw will, this this table will tell you which part of the brachial plexus are you suspicious of, and what are the differential diagnoses. And therefore, what sensory nerves must I do? What motor nerves must I do? What EMG must I do? And then you can get the answer within a few minutes. Okay. Um, okay, so this is about 30 minutes, 35 minutes, about just nice for. So I'm going to pause now for questions. Now, the last part, which is basically prognostication, it's a little bit long. So I was hoping that we could do that at another session. So now I'm going to just pause so that we have time for questions. I think, um, Dr. Nijab, you may have to unmute people if they want to ask questions, I guess. Is there a problem? Oh. Uh, please, uh, everyone, uh, close the camera. Okay. Good. Out, please. So, okay. If there are no questions, maybe I'll just take the liberty of explaining something that I, I think it's important, but maybe it didn't come through very clearly just now. So I wanted to tell you this, uh, the value of, uh, having something at the table like that and you know uh, for the especially for the EMG and of course the clinician can also use the same information so let me go back to this again right remember I said that these three nerves we talked so about have... yeah we talked about the axillary nerve the musculocutaneous nerve and the median nerve going to the pronator tube right and we realized that knowing the anatomy of these nerves allows you to ask a very detailed, a very fine-tuned, almost like an MRI, you know, you are looking into the patient's brachial plexus and saying, can I differentiate a posterior cord lesion from a lateral cord lesion? We are talking about real anatomy, we are only talking about a few millimeters. But the electrodiagnostician is able to do it because he appreciates that these two mass nerves have very similar origins, mm -hmm. very similar root, but they diverge as far as the cords are involved. So if you study this muscle and this muscle, muscles coming from this nerve and muscles coming from this nerve, if the muscles of these nerves are affected, but not these, then what is the diagnosis? Lateral cord. If the nerves, if the muscles of axillary nerve are all denervated, but muscular cutaneous nerves are all normal, then the diagnosis is posterior cord. So likewise, the clinician can examine the axillary nerve very carefully and the musculocutaneous nerve very carefully, biceps and sensation over to try to differentiate whether the patient's posterior cord is affected or lateral cord is affected. Likewise, the pronator teres muscle, which ends up, which ends up uh, in the pronator teres, but it's a median innervated muscle, it starts from C6, C7 and unlike the axillary nerve, it goes up to the lateral cord, not posterior cord. So again, if the deltoid is denervated, but the pronator teres is not denervated, then this must be posterior cord. If the pronator teres is denervated, but the deltoid is not denervated, then this must be not lateral cord. So you notice that the electrodiagnostician is actually very powerful, but the power comes not from very sophisticated information. All you need to do is just have a table like that on the board next to your EMG machine. And you can actually interrogate the EMG uh, brachial plexus very, very carefully. Of course, for pen brachial plexopathy, it's not very useful. But today I discuss on purpose partial brachial plexopathy, upper trunk, lower trunk, you know, neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. And then of course, sometimes during uh, accidents or bullet injuries, they may have one part affected, not another part. So, Sometimes you can actually help the rehab physician and the doctors who are involved in reanimating the brachial plexus. You want to know which nerves are intact, which nerves are severely affected. And that is some of the things that I'll be discussing in the second part, which is basically on, on the prognosis, how to understand the prognosis of brachial plexus by looking at CMAP, sensory nerve studies, as well as uh, denervation. Okay, so I think I've talked enough. So let's. Uh, Pause for questions. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, in, in, anyone uh, can can give you a question? Yes, yes, of course. Okay. So I think you just need to unmute them. 
In the meantime, you can download the notes from this uh, QR code for those who join later. And this is the barcode. You can scan it to give uh, to, to to take the presentation of Professor Amabafi. Uh, I think uh, uh, our friends, uh, Dr. Abdel Nasser from Iraq, uh, give you a lot of greetings. Okay. <laughs> yeah, too kind. Uh, 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 I think there is a question from. Uh, uh, Comer, uh, how to differentiate uh, C5 and C6 radicalopathy and C5 and C6 root lesion, both well preganglionic? Okay, um, so so can we can we repeat that question again, sir? So I, I meant to make sure that I understood it very well. How do we differentiate uh, C5? I, I you, C6? Have, uh, you have a uh, chat uh, below, uh, you can see it. Oh, how I do. C5 and C6 radicalopathy, mm -hmm. and C5 and 6 root lesion. They ask that. Uh, all uh, is a preganglionic. This, uh, this, uh, this okay. kind of him. So I think, I think most electrodiagnosticians, and, and there, there may be other senior electrodiagnosticians listening in, so it would be good to hear their, 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 um, their inputs. Uh, I think all, all of most electrodiagnosticians believe that we are, when we are dealing with a nerve root lesion, okay, because the nerve root lesion must involve that part of the nerve before the dorsal root ganglion. So therefore, that sensory nerve action potential must be spent. So in an area where the patient is complaining of numbness, you put the electrode and you find that the sensory nerve action potential is normal, and comparable with the other side. That tells us that the patient is numb in their dermatome, but the sensory potentials are normal. This straight away, that's why I say this, we all, that's why I always put sensory nerves first, because sensory nerves are actually very useful in starting off the study, because straight away it tells you what's happening. So you could straight away tell you if the sensory nerves are normal in an area, like the lady with that uh, thoracic out outlet syndrome, she was numb in digit five, numb in the medial aspect of the forearm, but the sensory potentials were reduced. This straight away makes it outside the nerve root, outside the spine. Okay, now I know there are many orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons who believe that nerve root compression can affect the dorsal root ganglion and structures outside the dorsal root ganglion and the sensory potentials can be reduced. Now, I think this is not widely accepted by neurophysiologists. Now, to address this question, there was a paper, which I'm, I cannot quote offhand, but I can find it because it's in my computer, came out last year, where they looked at the lumbar spine systematically. Okay? Um, um, can't remember the methodology, but systematically tried to figure out, can patients have nerve root compression post-ganglionic? Okay? That means they have spondylotic disease, but it's post-ganglionic. And they found that actually the proportion is so small that it's not clinically significant. So it kind of reiterates what we believe all this year, all this time. That if you find that in the numb area, the sensory potentials are normal, this must be a nerve root lesion. If the sensory potentials are abnormal, it is post-ganglionic. And therefore, it is, um, it is uh, uh, either brachial plexus or nerve. Okay, so for C5, C6, obviously you would go for um, C5, C6, obviously you would go for, remember we were saying just now, um, this, this nerve, okay. Right. So C5, we don't have a sensory nerve. C6, we have a very good sensory nerve, digit one. C6, uh, uh, and then C8, we have a very good sensory nerve, digit five. For C6, we also have medial cutaneous nerve with the forearm. Okay, and for T1, we also have, for T1, we also have medial cutaneous nerve form. Sorry, for C6, for C6, I, I say wrongly. For C6, we have lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm and we have digit 1 median. Okay, so if you are suspecting C6 reticulopathy, okay, C5 you cannot study because we don't have a sensory nerve study for C5. If you are suspecting C6 reticulopathy, the patient should be numb in C6 dermatome, but your sensory potentials of digit 1 median and lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm should be normal and comparable to the other side. Likewise, a C8 radiculopathy, the patient's sensory potentials at digit five 
should be normal and comparable to the other side. Likewise, a person with a T1 radiculopathy, the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm should be normal and comparable to the other side, even though they are complaining of numbness in their distribution. I hope I have answered that question. I'm not sure whether that's exactly what they meant, but I think it's often the question that's asked of me. Can you get abnormal sensory potentials in radiculopathy? The okay. short answer is no. Okay. Uh, I, I have a question for you, Professor Omar. Uh, uh, I have some struggling window uh, needle image and conduction study for uh, kids just below three years. So, you know, uh, also we can rely upon the sensor, the SNAP, because there is a certain loss, uh, incomplete demyelination. So already the, 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 the shape of the SNAP and the values differ a lot. So how can differentiate uh, between the pre and post ganglionic affection of the precaplexes? In kids below? Okay, I, I, I think three comments. Firstly, I don't normally do kids because in our setup, there is a pediatric hospital. Mm -hmm. So they do their own studies. So I cannot pretend to know about children. Okay, number two, uh, you notice that I think those of you, uh, uh, I had the opportunity to work with some of you, you know that whenever I do nerve conduction studies in EMG, I'm often quite minimalistic. Because we spend a lot of time with the history and examination and often we just need to do one or two nerves and we can get the answer. In fact, I used to be challenged in one of my training areas, uh, training uh, institute. Okay, tell me one nerve that you need to do to answer the patient's problem. Just one nerve. Oh, just one EMG that you need to do to give me the answer. And that's a good exercise because you force yourself to think about the most crucial nerve, the most crucial sensory nerve, the most crucial motor nerve and one EMG. Now, this is particularly important for children because they're going, to, they're going to withdraw consent after the first study. Yeah. So the first study that you're going to do must be the most crucial nerve. So, so study that you should do. So that's the second point that I'll make. The third point about uh, small sensory potentials, if they are very, very small, then I think the only way to solve it is to compare with the other side. Because uh, even in our um, uh, the pediatric hospitals, they don't have norms for children. In our adult uh, hospital, we have norms for children based on various age groups and height of the patient. But in children, often, I think it's better to just compare the right and the left side. Mm -hmm. And if there's a more than 50% difference, it's considered significant. I think beyond that, I cannot pretend to be an expert in children. So I may, I may have to ask you for some of the ways that you solve this problem, Dr. Nijin. Okay. Uh, a lot of uh, orthopedic surgeon uh, request a traumatic precalpulexis insult uh, and, and, and has a query about what about the root avulsion. Please detect if there is any root avulsion or not. What about the clinical issue and importance for this evaluation electrodiagnostic? Okay, so I think that's a very good question. I think we'll talk about that the next time when we discuss um, about prognosis. But you sh that's the reason why uh, I've at this table. And this table is actually, this slide is very important for that because Normally, when the patients are sent to us, even by the surgeons, usually the surgeons are the ones who are going to reanimate the brachial plexus. So they want to know which part of the brachial plexus the injury is preganglionic, yeah. which is also referred to as nerve root avulsion. So if it is preganglionic, that means proximal to the dorsal ganglion. It means that the pathology is between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And we know that the central nervous system, there's no regeneration. That's why all our stroke patients do badly. But peripheral nervous system, there's regeneration. But there cannot be regeneration between peripheral and central nervous system. So root avulsion means poor prognosis. So once they know the patient has root avulsion, they are more keen to, to go on to more aggressive procedures to try to bypass this, this pathology that the patient is having, you know, by getting the muscles innervated through other, like the intercostal musculocutaneous nerve, uh, transplant, for example. Okay, so how do we? So we often tell the uh, uh, the the, the uh, brachial plexus surgeons. Uh, clinically, I look very hard for brachial uh, for Horner syndrome. So so we do something like this. Uh, we put the patient in a dark room. Okay, we use a, a minimum amount of light, and we see whether there is a uh, failure to dilate with slight ptosis. Okay, so that straight away tells you 
at the T1 segment, at the T1 segment, at the T1 segment, it must be pre embryonic. Okay. Then after that, we will do all these maps actually. We will do medial cutis of the forearm, digit one, digit three, digit five, and lateral cutis of the forearm. Why? Because if the medial cutis of the forearm will tell us, confirm further whether T1 is pre or ganglionic, because paradoxically the patient will be completely numb, but the sensory potential will be very good. We will do digit five to look for C8 nerve root avulsion. And then at C67, we will do digit 3. And then for C6, we will do digit 1, thumb, okay, and lateral cutaneous nerve forearm. So we do all the sensory nerves, okay, and the only one that we cannot tell the surgeon, okay, is whether the C5 nerve root is above. So sometimes we try by uh, EMGing very proximal muscles like the rhomboid, the paraspinals, but we cannot be sure. So we try. But we cannot be sure. But for C6, C7, C81, we can tell them confidently, is it pre or post ganglionic? So in our report, not only do we, we have to give a three-dimensional report, not just in terms of whether it is the proximal part or the distal part of the brachial plexus affected. That means, is it the trunk? Is it the cord? Or is it the nerve that's affected? We will need to tell them uh, if, whether the nerve roots are valves because they will have poor prognosis. But not only that, we also need to tell them from the top to the bottom. Is it the upper part? The middle part or the lower part. So it's a two-dimensional, two-dimensional topographical electrodiagnosis that's given to the surgeon when they are very keen for surgical intervention. Okay? Yeah. So not only from the point of view of whether it's a nerve root, trunk, cord, or nerve, but also from the upper, middle, lower. And then of course, um, um, even nerves that are denervated outside the nerve root. Sometimes a complete transaction, the prognosis is still guarded. Okay? But at okay. least there's a chance. Yeah. But for nerve root avulsion, we straight away tell them no chance. Uh, anyone have, uh, have any question, please? Anyone? Uh, okay, what about the timing for, uh, optimal timing for uh, schedule as a follow-up? Follow-up schedule. Okay, so I think I can leave it to you, sir. So I'm okay with uh, as long as you give me advance notice so that I can reschedule. But usually nights are better. Um, so around about this time, I think it's quite reasonable for me because I would have finished work and would have come home. And uh, but at work, it's going to be a bit difficult because uh, um, yeah. But, but anyway, we have a six-hour difference with Egypt, right? So so that means um, yeah. I think we can negotiate, or we can do weekends, uh, like Saturdays, or Sundays, or, or Fridays. So, so I think um, uh, if, if the second and third part of, that, uh, of this talk, I would be uh, trying to cover some basics about uh, what makes up a CMAM, what makes up a SNAP. Uh, and then what makes, uh, what, how do you decide whether it's primarily an axonal disease or primarily demyelinating disease and how there's quite a bit of overlap between the two. Okay. And then finally, to summarize all of that, we will talk about how we use this information to prognosticate nerve injury, not just for brachial plexus, for any nerve injury, right? So if you have a cut um, a sciatic nerve or a cut a median nerve, how can you prognosticate whether the patient's going to recover? Do you operate? Do you not operate? So this kind of thing. So that will be there. So I'm thinking about uh, another two lectures, but we shouldn't make it too long because attention span of our audience will go down. Uh, just listening to my irritating voice continuously. But it's nice to see all of you. Please keep safe. Okay. Okay. Uh, any 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 question, please? Okay. Hoping uh, I to see you uh, in another talk. Uh, yes. Yes. Soon. Soon. Uh, uh, my greetings, my uh, thanks uh, for uh, for you. I think if there is a question. No, there is. There is a question. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Omabati. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I am okay. okay. And then, oh, I said uh, I must tell you that I must also welcome you to my home. This is the first time that so many people have come to my home, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's this is my simple house, simple flat that I live in. Seventy four. Okay. So. Okay. okay. Very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.
to be safe for everyone. Okay. Uh, نراكم على خير ان شاء الله سي يو سون ان انذر توبيك ويت اي ثينك وي هاف اجريمنت فروم بروفيسور اريك ستالبرغ هي ويل سبيك اباوت ذا سام ايشوز اباوت ذا سينجل فايبر اي ام جي بروفيسور اوما بروفيسور كيمورا هاز ا بروبلم وذ ذا تكنولوجي so uh, he he cannot use uh, the zoom or or something like that they still uh, till now he has no any uh, cellular phone uh, professor kimura so uh, I, i will prepare uh, another one to uh, uh, to to to, uh, to help us uh, in uh, uh, some uh, event uh, nearly so uh, see you again uh, soon with professor uh, eric uh, starberg bye السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته نراكم على خير ان شاء الله كل سنه وحضراتكم طيبين السلام عليكم انا هسجل المحاضره ديت وهرفعها على الموقع عشان اللي عايز يحتفظ بيها ان شاء الله السلام عليكم والسلام ورحمه الله وبركاته